I'd like to call to order tonight's meeting of the Naval Board of Education. Uh, welcome everybody who's here. Uh, our first item on the agenda tonight is to approve the meeting agenda. Is there a motion? I move we uh, approve the agenda as submitted. Second. So motion is second. All in favor of the motion to stay say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next is um, <coughs> the reports and presentation section of the meeting. Um, are there any board member comments? I just have one comment, Mr. Becker. Uh, I just want to thank everyone in the district for keeping their kids home and keeping them safe. It was an extraordinary week last week, and uh, it was it was probably as trying on the parents and kids, and also the teachers. And my wife's a teacher, and she wanted to go to work, so maybe that's because she didn't want to be home with me. I'm not sure, but anyways. But thank you all very much, and, and to our staff and administrators and our maintenance crews. Couldn't this day wouldn't happen without all you guys. Thank you. Anybody else? We do appreciate all the work that went on last week, even though there was no school, there was a lot of activity. So thanks to everyone for that. Um, next is the superintendent's report. All right, uh, I too want to make a comment about the weather. Uh, it's no longer just a polite conversation when it comes down to this kind of funding. One thing that we want to remind folks is that while there is still, while roads are relatively clear, in a lot of cases it's just one lane. So our pickup and drop off is still sometimes tricky because if a car is coming the other direction, it's much more difficult for the bus to be able to back out of that street. So where possible, where cars can continue to give us the right of way, we'll be able to be much more efficient to pick up and drop off processes of that. And the same is true even around our school. We've done a great job clearing the lots, but oftentimes when the snow is piled, has disrupted some of the normal carpool pickup drop off spaces. And we had a couple issues today where that blocked our buses from being able to get to the bus lanes to be able to pick kids up and be able to get them home on time. So wherever possible, if we can still uh, give preference to our the big yellow uh, objects, but that's going to make it a lot easier for all of us to get the right to and from school. Um, we had an hour delay uh, this morning. We will run on time tomorrow morning. Um, the only issues that we had to deal with this morning was exactly what we anticipated. There are a couple turnaround spots for our buses where Snow was plowed into, which limited some of that access. Uh, but Ed had to clear out first thing this morning before the buses ran to help clear that space. So folks have been working night, day, weekend, and so forth to make sure that we were able to run and we will be on time tomorrow. Other things I would like to discuss is that on Wednesday, I, I will be at the Fund for Transforming Education, which is their uh, Innovate in Education meeting, which is held at Louisville to Henry Clay. We're discussing college and career, soft skills, alternative school models, business partnership opportunities, and jobs for the future. A lot of this uh, ties into our work even locally as we get into more of the measurement side of our performance-based assessment. The fifth grade rubric that's been used uh, for gateways is something that we're trying to revise and update into more usable format. It's traditionally been a checklist, and we're trying to move it into full-blown rubric. The difference being checklist is something that exists or not, rubric being the quality of the work that is actually displayed. I actually have a couple samples that if you want to look at at some point in time, I'll show you what that conversation looks like, what it means in, in actuality. It's the same conversation we see in our Next Generation Learning Academy that just met, uh, it's always lost track of time now, about a week and a half ago. And in that work, it's about developing a, a universal innovation framework that includes issues like the diploma skills, uh, content knowledge, process, which one can consider a formative uh, way of knowing, as well as a presentation, which would be a summative way of knowing. And the Next Generation Academy folks have been hustling to try and figure out how that can be a tool universally applied K through 12. It was meant to be piloted this past week, which obviously made it a little more difficult to do so. So we'll be working on those deadlines to still make a, an early March uh, check-in point for the quality of work that's being done. Tied into those same diploma skills, this was or last week was supposed to be Leadership Week at Jenny Rogers, and President Roush was to present, uh, which unfortunately got snowed out but I'm sure that will be rescheduled. The good part is that I was able to go and hang out on Center's campus last week and talk both with an education policy class and as well as a collaboration research project with one of their statistics classes that's looking at learning regression analysis. So Center students will be working with a set of our data from here in the district to look at what are some of the best predictors of e-pass performance, explore, plan, and ACT, and looking at a series of numbers and ways in which that can be modeled. And that group, once that project is complete, will be back here to present to the board their findings. Um, and that is my report. Okay. Um, next is our uh, celebrations of excellence. Um, and I'll try 
and then back over to Dr. Wilson to kick off. All right. Ms. Lee, would you like to come join us at the podium to introduce your middle school summer tour? Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us tonight. And I don't think they're all here, but we do have a few ready to be recognized. I'm going to read their names off, even if I don't get to actually hand them anything tonight. But um, tonight we're recognizing three different groups. We had several students that were able to meet all four benchmarks on the Explore test for eighth grade. And our seventh grade also took the Explore test, which is the first in the series of three that lead up to the ACT. And um, we had several seventh graders as well. Seventh and eighth graders both did very well on our Explore test, many of them meeting all four benchmark scores, which is a predictor of success for the ACT test. So I'd like to recognize those two groups. And I'd also like to recognize five very special students that have excelled in the area of the arts as far as um, all state fame. We had some great, great successes with that. I don't know if these students are here, but um, we did have one student. Josh Warren, are you here? I don't see him. I just want to recognize him, even though he's not here. We had a student, Josh Warren, who came in first chair in the state. First chair in the state for two months. Josh Warren is a great success for him. So that was Josh. Peyton Young, if Peyton is here, we have ninth chair trumpet. Ben Lee, Ben Lee had 13th chair trumpet. Lily Detillion, 14th chair trumpet. And Jess Perry, 24th player chair net. No, I said they're wrong. <laughs> 24th chair clarinet. So we had some really great success at Mr. Towns. I'm really proud of it. I wanted to let y'all know about that and we'll pass those out at school. Then we also have seventh graders who met all four benchmarks on the Explore test. It's a snowy night, so I'm going to read their names. And if they're here, I'd like to hand these to you. If you're not, I'll give it to you at school. Colin Carver, Valerie Fever, Grayson Folks. Grayson. Oh, Grayson, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's great to see you today. You have to shake your hand. So can you get your name? You have to say it over here. You have to oh. shake my hand. It's required. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, do you like to come on out? Do you want to talk to the rest of them and then we'll do a group photo? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we had Grayson, Amal Gondal. Amal, are you here? Um, Eleanor Grubbs. Kirsten Hale. Benjamin Lee. Al McKinney, Joseph Sanders, and Emma Webb. So we have one seventh grader, and you can remain up there, and we'll have our eighth grader join you too. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. In case I wasn't clear, the score test is usually given in eighth grade. And so for a seventh grader to meet all four benchmark scores is really quite an accomplishment. So I can't wait to see what Grayson does next year. For eighth grade, meeting all four benchmarks, we have Dylan Cunningham, we have Grace Crawford, uh, Luke Darty, William Tillian, Grace Gaffney, Anas Gondal, Eli Gooch, Natalie Gruss, Charlie Hall, Ben Harper, Adam Hibbs, Evie Kincaid, Alec McAllister. Oops, let me catch up with my list here because I have the next one present. Emma Merriman. Yay! <laughs> Um, it's Shelby Pittman, Sadie Price, Morgan Best, and Peyton Young. Completes our list. Emma, thank you for coming out. This is great. Thank you, Emma. recognition and two groups. So I'm going to recognize the individual first. Uh, Austin Barringer, you come up please. 
Two weeks ago, Austin received the opportunity to represent uh, the Henry Clay Center for Statesmanship at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. Um, during each session of Congress, Henry Clay, a great Kentuckian, brought a bourbon, a barrel of bourbon, uh, to Congress, uh, to lubricate Congress, as he called it. And for the first time since Clay left Congress, uh, the state of Kentucky sent a barrel of bourbon uh, as a symbol of compromise for the work that our Congress is doing. And Austin got the opportunity or earned the opportunity to go speak at that event. And he not only spoke uh, and represented Danville High School in the state of Kentucky, but he also had the opportunity to speak in front of several influential politicians, including Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and uh, House Speaker John Banger. So Austin not only represented DHS well in Washington, he was on several news outlets, and we are just very proud of Austin and his accomplishments. So Austin, congratulations. second uh, recognition goes to uh, the robotics ads. This is our second year in competition and I've invited Coach Goodwin to come and to share with us the accomplishment of the team. So, one of them. And I think they also brought a friend with them as well that I haven't gotten Corey to name yet. So. I don't do much more than talk. Uh, so these guys uh, Corey Stever, Chase Goldie, Gus Crow, Brandon Gray, Cameron Villanueva, and we're missing Ethan Quinn, Kyle Smith, and Tristan Redmond. Have been working for the past six months to build this thing. Um, you know, look those so they can see at the back. Uh, they've been to three competitions and they qualified for the state championships, which has now been postponed, which means top 32 teams in the state, which is pretty good. Um, this is 100 percent student built. All the advice that I gave them, they keep shutting down and doing the opposite of. So um, it's worked so far. It has worked. So uh, anyway, um, they'll be competing next Saturday in Louisville. So. Oh, and so they have these folders. Okay. So can you explain the competition? What's the robot? So oh yeah. So uh, Mr. McKinney, could you help hand up the or hold up that? Uh, cube in front of you. So they have to pick up those cubes and stack them here. And then there's the yellow sky rise pieces that they build up and they put the cubes on top of them. They can do it in two minutes. The first 15 seconds is autonomous, meaning they don't get to use the remote control. Then they have to write the computer program that tells the robot to go and do what it's supposed to do to score as many points. And then after 15 seconds of autonomous mode, then it goes to driver control and they have a minute and 45 seconds to continue scoring as much as they can. On top of that, you can also score just by driver skills. So they give you a minute to score as much as you can all by yourself. Or they have programming skills, which is where you program it to work all by itself for a minute. And it was through the programming skills that our group qualified for state. So that's sort of an overview of what they do. Am I good enough? Yeah. All right. Uh, that's for you. Gus, Chase, yeah. Brandon, Tristan, not here, Kyle, not here, Corey, Ethan, and Cameron. Yeah, I don't hear those two things. Cool. Um, how about you guys get over there and drive the robot? <laughs> Uh, on his behalf. 
Danville High School won the Bluegrass Regional Speech Tournament of the Kentucky High School Speech League by a wide margin on Saturday, February the 7th, over second place Lexington Henry Clay. DHS qualified 37 entries to compete at the state tournament in March and took home regional champion honors in five of the 13 events with regional runner-up honors in six of the events. DHS will enter the state contest as one of the favorites as it seeks to win the event for a sixth time. The following students won first or second place for the entire region in their categories and were named regional speech champions or regional runners up. So when I call your name, please come up. In broadcasting, McCallum Morley and Sydney Mullins. McCallum was the regional champion and Sydney Mullins was the regional runner up. Declamation, Tanisha Bruce was the regional runner-up. Dramatic Interpretation, Laurel Payne was the regional champion, and Austin Barringer was the regional runner-up. In extemporaneous speaking, Mary Scott Bug was the regional runner-up. In original oratory, Hibba Siddiqui was the, original, the regional champion. In poetry, Grace Sheen was the regional champion. In program oral interpretation, Zane Arnold was the regional runner-up. And in prose, Laurel Payne was the regional runner-up. So again, congratulations to our speech champions. <laughs> you, yes, you were. Lydia Graham was the champion of humorous interpretation. <laughs> Thanks to everybody and for representing our school district so well in so many different ways. It's exciting to be able to uh, celebrate your uh, performances tonight. And next on our agenda is the school spotlight, and we have um, Mr. Radalazzo from Hogsa to speak to us. all that the board does for not only Hobson Elementary but every school in the district. Um, I wanted to highlight just some things. You know, I'm new here to Hobson and so I wanted to highlight some of the things that I've been learning about Hobson as well. Um, I handed out to you our um, monthly newsletter um, that we also post online on our website. Um, we also provide it in Spanish for families that need that. Um, but it's one of the things that I like to be able to keep that open line of communication with the parents um, here at Hogsett. I did want to highlight just a couple of um, different programs and, and things here at Hogsett. Um, our Expressions Art Program um, uses um, teachers from special ed, art, um, OT, our occupational therapists, and then also our speech pathologists. But our Expressions Art Program highlights students, um, gives them an opportunity to use um, art as a creative outlet. Um, they meet monthly, and it's not only students at Hogsett, but it's the other elementary schools here in Vanville as well. Um, 
Uh, the aspect of this is that they do use, um, utilize peer mentors, so we get kind of both ends of the spectrum, and it's really kind of a win-win situation um, with that. The teachers are very invested in the in, in that the expressions art program, and, and it's been a wonderful um, program to see grow. Um, two years in a row now, um, a Hawks of Students artwork has been chosen to be part of a BSA Student Traveling Art Exhibit. And BSA stands for Very Special Arts. It's a statewide program. Um, there were 28 pieces that were chosen, and one of our very own students here at Hawks, a kindergartner named Brooklyn Knoll, um, and I think she was recognized at one of the meetings, but she, um, her artwork was chosen. Um, the whole um, traveling art show um, was part of the 2014 Kentucky Exceptional Children's Conference in Louisville, and it was on display during that conference. And then we requested for that um, display to come to Hogsett Elementary. And so it's going to be here the first week of March. So sometime next week, we are expecting it to be here, and it'll stay a few days or stay a week. Uh, but we're excited about that. Um, another kind of highlight that I wanted to bring out is our, our theater productions that we've had here at Hogsett. Um, we've had a win we had a winter musical, and then also a fall production of Fabio and Juliet, which was kind of a mashup of different Shakespeare plays. Um, and it's just been a great experience for the students to be involved with um, a production that, that allows them to be on stage with um, lighting and sound, um, scenery, props, and costumes. It's just been a really rich experience for them. And it's a perfect example of hands-on project-based learning. Um, um, the part that I love the most, along with all of that other the other things that I've mentioned, was that it really gives every student an opportunity to find personalized success. So if a student isn't necessarily um, the highest academically, they were able to find success in um, those, those productions. Um, and so it, it's a really kind of a neat thing um, that um, Danville High School opens the theater um, you know, to, to allow us to have productions there. So. Um, our academic team successes, um, we have, and, and this is kind of a, a different thing to talk about with the academic team um, successes because um, it's a very young team, all the way from the coaches to the students. Um, we have first year coaches this year um, with just a couple of returning members from last year, but yet they were able to find some success and, and it was really neat to see um, their spring start um, so strong. They finished second in two out of the three superintendent comp competitions this spring, and so they were really excited about uh, that. Um, several students have meddled in individual uh, content area assessments, and we're looking forward to district competitions um, February 28th, um, which is at Junction City Elementary, and then our regional competition, um, which we are hosting right here at Hobson, uh, March 21st. So we're, you know, our, our academic team, while it's young, is, is really finding some success and renewed um, life in that. And I wanted to acknowledge um, Ms. Maggie Tyree um, and Ms. Angel Davis, both fifth grade teachers here at, at Hobbs. Um, our preschool family nights have been a success this year. In, in November, we had 94 um, students, parents, staff um, attend, and the focus was reading. Um, our Dr. Luck was actually part of that program that night and helped to read to the students. Um, in February, we had another uh, preschool family night and 130 um, students, parents, and staff participated. And that night, the focus was health and wellness and, be, and being active. So that was a fun night um, um, for those families too. I think it's a wonderful way for our, our new families to the Danville schools to get to know what Animal Schools is all about. The preschool program is a perfect um, introduction to Animal Schools, and if you haven't had a chance to come and visit the program, um, you really should come out and see what they do in there. It's, it's wonderfully run and um, a, a great program. Our next family night um, is April 23rd, so that's coming up. I'm also excited about our uh, K-3 writing program here at Hogsett, um, writing. 
is a school-wide emphasis um, for us here at Hogsett. Um, we have writing samples displayed in the hallways, and then we even have a special bulletin board, our WOW bulletin board um, for Writers of the Week. Um, and we highlight, each um, teacher highlights a, a different uh, writing example um, and student um, for the week. And that's been really popular. The students, it's located right out here in the front hallway. Every student passes by it on the way to the lunchroom. And I've seen students stop and, and look at their picture or look at their artwork. And um, it's just been a really neat um, way to highlight the student work. And then also the student work um, in, the, in the hallways um, with the emphasis on writing. And not just the older grades, but um, we really begin um, you know, with kindergarten and the high expectation of um, being Excellent writers. Um, the last thing that I wanted to highlight that it kind of goes along with being writers, um, our Boyle County DAR uh, speech contest, um, three of the, the, the three winners were from Hogsett Elementary, and um, our first place was Kaniah Pruitt, second place was Abigail Anderson, and third place was Ryan Clarkson, all um, fifth grade students. But Kaniah's speech is going to go on the state competition, um, and then we should find out results in March. But I'm really excited for those students. Um, it's just being able to see the writing um, the expectations from kindergarten all the way up to what the fifth graders are able to do um, is really exciting for us. And, um, that is definitely an emphasis for us. Um, like I said, I'm new to Hobbsit. Hobbsit is, is a wonderful school. Um, teachers work hard every day to provide quality learning experiences. Um, the staff and students and families have been very warm and welcoming to me. Um, and what's been most impressive to me is that they're, open, they're so open to change. Um, they're willing to look at um, different ideas or different ways to do things. So, um, and I've taken the full advantage of that. You know, I, I want to keep what's working for us here in Hobbsit, but I also know that um, you know, if, if things can be done better, open to their suggestions as well, but they've been very open to change and we've been able to, to put some changes in and, and hopefully reap the rewards. So I'm excited to see what the future holds for us and I invite you to, after the meeting, if you want to walk the halls and kind of see some of the student work, um, you know, Hobson, I've I've been told that Hobson is a great school and even before I got here I knew Hobson um, I was in Jessamine County, but I knew um, Hobbs at elementary, so to be here, I'm just really excited um, to be part of the school and um, to be the principal at Hobbs at elementary. But welcome, and, and thank you for, again for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Or any questions? No, you may find us wandering around uh, after the meeting, so we look puzzled then. We may have questions at that point. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And if you've not had the chance yet to spend much time with Leo, you will find such an amazingly even keeled temperament that is able to balance such a family dynamic in this building in a way that the, the quality of leadership that's been provided in his first year as being an administrator has truly been exceptional. And I hope that everybody's got a chance to. I look forward to coming over here every time just because I like to see how he presents, what his folks are doing. You can tell by the way in which folks respond to him in the hallways, the way in which the kids respond to him in the mornings way in which even staff handle themselves outside of his presence and the reflection of his quality of leadership has just been tremendous as a petition to Hawks. It's been great. So thanks, Nick. Thank you. All right. Um, next is the school library report. And please to share. ahead of time we're having some conflict with uh, different PowerPoint versions so I promise you that I did not mean for some of the slides to be kind of wonky so work with us through that and I you do have a printed hard copy in front of you with the handout version if you'd like to um, make notes of questions you may have. So first of all you'll see on the screen there is a picture and this unfortunately is a current picture of a shelf in Danville High School's library. So you can see hands in the past. That's what I wanted to focus on. We need to get away from that is now. Some questions that I'd like you to ponder as we're going through the presentation. 
What comes to mind when you think of school libraries? What library experiences did you have growing up and currently with the public schools and our school system? And what experiences do you anticipate for your own children or for our Danville School's children as a whole? Those are some things I'd like you to think about. As far as I'm concerned, there's the secret to exceptional schools, there's only two things we need. People, good people can make anything happen. And the second are library media centers. Now, I know I'm a little biased, and some people are probably thinking, what on earth is she talking about? But it is true, and let me tell you why. Library media centers are changing. They're not the way they were when we were growing up. Library media centers are innovation centers. They're a place where students can find can solve their curiosity and creativity are nurtured. It's a place where technology and resources abound. And it's also a place that is the hub of all reading. And reading is the beginning of all things good. Library media centers in the new school library are innovation centers. We have a focus on project-based learning. And that's a place where we have three different um, services, multifunctions, that the library can serve. And one of those is it can be a production and presentation space where students can work on their PBATs and their capstones. And they have, um, we can equalize across students as far as having resources available, video equipment and things they can check out and use. They're teaching spaces. The library is no longer a place where you just go and pick something off the shelf to use. It's a place where you go and learn about how to um, find available resources and what's useful and what's not and how to decipher what is what what is good and what is not so useful. It's also a place for social learning spaces, a place where students want to go to meet their friends, to figure out how to do things together, to be innovative, and to be able to solve problems and be creative. So on that realm, we started at the high school level. We're gonna have some information about all the schools in the district, but I'm gonna give some more specific examples from the high school because that's where my experience lies. So this, just this school year, we've started what's called a creation station which is kind of a, a spin of a maker space. We have a whole section where students come and there's just things available for them to do, to experience, to play with, to manipulate. And so in that creation station, I've got some pictures that are just from the last few months of things that students are doing. So we've got um, the boards on the top where kids write to each other, they draw out things, they work on some information. Are we stuck? Okay. We have puzzle wars. We have, you wouldn't believe how fascinated the students get with those 3D puzzles and be able to solve those. We have circuit boards where students are figuring out how to do different kinds of circuits, what makes things work. Um, I'm going to keep going. And we also have, there's a, there's a quote that I wanted to share with you, and that's that we have to stop thinking about a library as a grocery store, which is a place to get stuff. And we have to start thinking about libraries as a kitchen, as a place to make things. We also have Connects roller coasters where students are using physics and they're building things and creating things, sometimes by recipes and sometimes on their own, trying to figure out and make things happen. And it's still a study place. It's still a place where kids come and they work together in groups. And we also have options where students can bring their own devices and they can work on their own materials together independently. This is a very common occurrence in our space throughout the day, before and after school. We also have different projects. We're, we use the library every day during the edge. We've done some upcycling projects where we've taken some old discarded books and made things with them and um, done some things where the kids can take them. So when I was going through school, this was our social networking, okay? And I don't know if you guys want to be with me in that realm or not, but <coughs> when I was in school, this was our social networking. And today, this is our social networking. And likewise, our Learning networking happens the exact same way. It's changing. It's not the way it was before, and we have to catch up with it. So the question that was posed to the library media specialist was what would it cost to create and maintain a library collection that was desired by students? Not just a place that you know meets the status quo, but a place that's going to work, that's going to be innovative, that's going to be creative, and that students are going to want to um, battle to be in there and use it. So these are the things that we found are our budget needs. Every library media center needs a library media specialist. They can follow the library subscription. That's kind of like our um, operating system for the libraries. It's how we work with everything that goes on in the space. Um, Renaissance Learning, it's our AR programs for all the schools. It's the Star Reading, uh, the Kentucky Virtual, Virtual Library. We use a lot of online resources now. We don't use as many 
textbooks and reference materials. This is not a space for encyclopedias anymore. It's all online, but those things still cost, and so we need, this, we need to have the money to pay for those subscriptions to use those online resources. Um, we also still need print materials and periodicals, but those are changing. They're not the same as they were when we were in school. The students, I've got wait lists of kids that request different fiction books and nonfiction books for things they want to learn about or things they want to read because they're on the third set of a series and we're missing four and five. And I've got the, the wait list of, of finding those materials and ordering for them for them as quickly as possible. Our periodicals aren't US News and World Reports anymore or Time Magazine. Yeah, we still have a couple of Time Magazines and things like that, but we also have guitar magazines and we have uh, make magazine. We have all these things that students can get and it's the things that they want. It's not the things that adults think they need, it's the things that kids want to read. And that's important. And that, again, reading is the beginning of all things good. So we have to foster that. Creation Station, the Makerspace resources. I'll be honest, a lot of the things that we have now, we've made, borrowed, stolen, whatever, and we're, we're making do and we're uh, we're cobbling some things together, but that has so much potential and we can do so many things for our students and have so many things for them to, to use that information. And we want to be able to do that and have the resources to do it. Technology for students. I would love to, to say and to believe that all of our students are equal in the resources department, but we know that's not true. Our demographics are changing and we have a lot of students that don't have the same resources. If you can believe it or not, we still have students that come through our building that do not have cell phones which is shocking, and they would, if you ask somebody on the street, they wouldn't believe that that's true, but there are still kids in that situation. So likewise, we have kids that don't have access to video cameras, or they don't have access to um, you know, computers at home, or iPads, or things where they can do all the things that their teachers are requiring for them to do in order to be successful in the classroom. And the library is a place to the great equalizer for us to be able to pro provide things for students so that everyone is in the same place. And then we also want things that, you know, our wish list, a 3D printer for kids to work with and use the CAD program and all kinds of technologies. And I would love to have a corner where I've got a green screen set up 24 seven and the kids can come in and film their videos instead of being all running around the halls and interrupting classes so they can build their PBATs and their capstones and things for the classroom. And I want it to be the space, we all do, we want it to be the, the core of all things in, in the school. That's the place you go to find out anything. So again, you'll notice on the screen it says, you know, all the list of technologies, including the things that we have not yet discovered, that we know we need in the future. So all that being said, this is what we're working with. Um, I can't speak for the other librarians, but for the high school, I have a budget of $9,000. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that sounds like a whole lot of money. But when you break it down to the things that are required, so before August 1, I have already spent $1,300 on our Follett subscription, $2,600 on Renaissance Learning, and that subscription, we've whittled it down. I don't even have a subscription for every kid in the building. I have a, a set number, and I cycle kids through. Some kids can use it one semester, and some do it the other semester, and we have to kind of, we cobble it together and make do with that, because I'm a penny pincher, and I want to try to get as much as we can out of what we have to work with, as we all do. Um, $500 for the Kentucky Virtual Library. So $4,400 of that $9,000 are spent before we walk in the door. That leaves $4,600 available for books, technology, resources, and all other supplies. So that's kind of a pie chart to give you a, a visual of that information. So almost half of our budget is spent before the school starts. And just to kind of give you a frame of reference, when I've got 20 bucks in my pocket, that sounds like a lot of money if I'm going to McDonald's. But if I'm going to pay my heat bill of $365, the $20 isn't going to get me very far. So kind of as a frame of reference, I think the high school copy paper bill was $3,500. So just kind of to give you some idea of how the numbers play out. So that being said, that's some information about budgets, where we're coming from, where we want to go. So where do we stand right now? Currently, this is all of our library media centers in the district with their average age of collections. And what that means is the average copyright date of every material on the shelf, whether it be DVDs to print materials to um, nonfiction books, that's the average age of the collection. So the current average age of the collection for Danville High School is 1992. That is horrific. When I started in 2001, 
the average age of Danville High School's collection was 1977, which, even, which was even worse. So with a little bit of resources, every year you add a weed, and weed means you discard things that are no longer relevant or outdated. So every year you add a weed, add a weed, add a weed. So in that short period of time, I've been able to bring it from 1977 to 1992. So I'm pretty proud of that. That's pretty exciting. But then I think, hmm, it's 2015. That's horribly embarrassing. I don't want anybody to see that number. But when you think about, again, where you're coming from and what you have to work with, I think you have to understand that the point I'm trying to make is no, but there's, it's not a situation where there's stuff on the shelf and people aren't doing their jobs. You know, we're all, all of us are working to the best of our ability and we're, we're squeezing every penny and we're appreciative and grateful for everything that we have. And we squeeze it out and we're trying to make the best of what we have. But that being said, where are we gonna be in 15 years? We continue this cycle. It's like our schools are moving forward. We wanna do all these wonderful, fabulous things and we're leaving some things behind that could be such a great asset. And we wanna make sure we catch up together. So what would it take to weed each collection? What would it take to get rid of all this junk that we don't need anymore? Um, and just looking at, like, logistically. Logistically, we think it could take three librarians and maybe two to three center interns that we could get together. And in three days, three to four days, we could go into each library and completely weed and get rid of everything that shouldn't be there. Because it's a process. You know, things have to be pulled, marked, taken out of computers, et cetera, et cetera. So in 15 to 20 days, all the libraries could be down to the bare bones of all the things that are good, gotten rid of everything that we don't need. Then what would it take to fix the library media centers and bring them up to date? So you have to have a time to purge, that weeding time, a time to order, and then to process and restock all those new materials. So looking, there's a, there's a chart and there's a, a slide for each school, but I'm just going to kind of describe the high school one and you can use the same, it applies to each school. So according to the ALA standards, and there's a whole bunch of information that you use to come up with these formulas, but according to our school and our size and where we're located, we should have 10,400 titles at Danville High School. Well, because I try to weed consistently and I can't always um, replace everything that I'm taking off the shelf, we're a little behind. We currently have 7,167 titles. The number of that 7,000 that are aged titles, which means they should not be on the shelf, they're too old. Each category or different things have a different age limit. For instance, computer books, you don't keep those as long as you would, history books, et cetera, et cetera. So according to all the formulas that are accurate, 47% of our collection is aged. It should be pulled off the shelf, dumped, and replaced. That means 3,396 items should be replaced. So you take that number plus the number that were below what we should have in our space, it has a total number that should be replaced. Now they have items on the list of, uh, there's different resources where you can find information about the average cost of books, reference, nonfiction, um, fiction, et cetera, et cetera. We've kind of rounded that up because we know we're not gonna replace as many, we're not gonna replace encyclopedias. We're not gonna replace the things we don't need because we're using online information. So we've kind of taken all that information into consideration and cobbled it to where we've got a $15 per book um, estimate. So that gives you a total cost to update just the high school library. But breaking that over five years, we can take it down to about $20,000 a year for five years. So that's the concept, that's the formula, and there's a slide for each school. So I'm going to have Greg just kind of go through all those, and you have copies of those on the back of your worksheet if you want to go through them specifically for your school. And you can see the percent of the collection that's aged is different for each school. So once we have things up to par, what would it take to maintain the library media centers as they should be? And it's recommended that a collection total times 5%, you should replace 5% of your collection once it's where it should be then you should only be replacing 5% per year. So there's a graph there, and you'll notice there's sections of it that's missing. Because technology, we wish and dream big. Technology can be as little as a couple of thousand, it can be as much as 10,000. I mean, it just depends on what you want to do and where you want to go with it. 
The subscription also is blank because that's an, um, there's some ideas and there's lots of districts that feel like some of those subscriptions that all schools use should be paid at the district level. So that's why that's blank and that's why the total is empty because it depends on where we want to go. What are our goals? What do we want to happen? What do we want to see? And that's something we can talk about and discuss. So that's what, it's not incomplete. It's just there for us to dream about what we like. There's lots of talk about ebooks versus print books. Why are we buying print books? Uh, why aren't we buying all ebooks? And there's lots of reasons. I like this graph because it tells you different purposes for reading. Uh, you know, some people assume, oh, all librarians just like print books. Well, no, that's not true. I'm currently listening to an audiobook in my car. I've got ebooks. I've got three or four books by my nightstand. You know, all of it is good and all of it's relevant, and we need all of them for different reasons and different purposes. We have lots of kids that don't have access to the readers for the ebooks, or we have lots of kids that do. So we need some of all of it. You know, we want to have those ebooks that kids can download, and through Destiny, we can purchase those, and kids can download them on their phone or their iPads or whatever device they want. We don't even have to purchase the devices for them to use, but we can do that too for kids that don't have them. So that's just a great resource to see for the different function of what you want. Prints better, and other types of ebooks are better. And here's a busy, busy slide. And I like this slide because it tells you sometimes about the purpose in the, the presentation of the, of the school libraries. That's what our day looks like every day. It's that busy and crazy. And there's no two days that are alike. And this deals specifically a lot with technology and the fact that we do a lot and, we, and there's a lot that still needs to be done. Um, you'll notice the big bubble on the left-hand side that's in blue, 96%. When kids are 94%. When kids go to do research, nine times out of 10, the first place they go is Google. Well, heck, when I want to know something quick, that's the first place I go to. But if I'm going to do information, if I'm doing research about personal things or about work things or anything, that's not the first place I go. Because I don't want to waste my time sifting through all the junk. I want to find what I need to find that's going to, to make my life easier and get what I need to know. And those are the things that students need to know. And those are the things that library media specialists help kids find what they need fast and quick and what, what's most useful for them. And the quote in the blue at the bottom I also want to point out to you. Because to me, this is the goal of all library media centers and specialists and centers, and really for most educators. But school libraries provide equitable, physical, and intellectual access to the resources and tools required for learning in a warm, stimulating, and safe environment. And that's what we want. That's the whole goal. It needs to be the center and the focal point of any school, and for those reasons. So you'll... Education can be encouraged from the top down, but can only be improved from the ground up. So we do have a situation, but our situation is preparing students for the future. So those are some things to think about. Um, you have a copy of the PowerPoint to go through. You also have a handout. And on the handout, it's on the back page. It has the different chart for each individual school for you to look at. And on the other side are some game plan options. What can we do? And there's three different options here. And um, and there's some things to think about, there's some things to mull over. You know, option one is to find the money tree. We find the money tree and we fix it all right now. Every bit of it. Start to finish and it's fabulous. Or we can find the money shrub and we find lots of money and we, we break it in five years and we, we fix it. And then my personal favorite is the Dave Ramsey snowball plan. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Dave Ramsey, but you look at the big problem and you take it a little chunk at a time. And one of those options would be to look at maybe bait in the high school now, and then when we finish the restructuring of the elementary schools, then focus on those, and we kind of spread it out. But really, this is just the purpose of the purpose of this presentation is just simply to start a conversation to see what can we do, what can we do for our students, and what can we do for our community. And uh, this is a great place to start. Any questions? Um, I'll just start by just saying that uh, originally we had. Anticipate you coming into a work session and kind of talking to us in that atmosphere um, and our desire to be able to cover the Spanish program which we did a couple of weeks ago we bumped uh, Mr. Sheraton tonight so this really is not the ideal venue but I think that the great thing about this is this is all really needy important information for us to have to be able to look at and um, even if we don't have questions or are able to settle on something tonight, this gives us something to ponder and think about to, to start the conversation that we, that we really need all, I think we all know that we need to have and need to think about. So, but if anybody has questions, I just wanted to tell you guys about the context of why why this happened here tonight 
and, and that it really is something that fits that we may come back to uh, sooner rather than later in work session to be able to kind of ponder further. But if anybody has any questions for Can everybody tonight, wait for me to show uh, just let me know. Anybody? I, I guess to me it's kind of remarkable that the libraries have changed so much, media centers, whatever, I guess, because I still like a book. That's just me. And, but I do know my children who all went to like the computers. They like to read them on the go, hopefully not while they're driving, and all these good things. So this obviously is a huge need. It's something that we've just not kept up with. And maybe some of that is we didn't know exactly. You know, give me the book. I don't worry about the rest. So well, we still need the book. Yes. <laughs> So I like your separation of the how-to maybe due to some of the funding, but if if there were particular priorities, what would be your top two priorities for, for needs? For needs? Well, I'll be honest, I mean, resources in general. I mean, I want to get things in the hands of students. I mean, that's the number one priority. So, um, and. We have some schools that don't have library media specialists right now, and that's a huge need. Um, so to me, those would be the top two. You know, resources to get in the hands of kids and people to help the students. First of all, great presentation. That was just really informative, and I can tell you've done a lot of work. Um, I'm just curious what you learned about the connection between school libraries and community libraries. Um, and if there is one, if there's a way that we can use the resources that we have right here in town, so close to all of our downtown schools. <laughs> it scared me watching you get scared. Uh, if, if anything, you know, when you were... Yes, and we have been. In fact, that's um, before seeing the Embridge, just last year, when we started lots of conversations with the public library, and we've been doing some things with them and some resources. In fact, one of the things we tried to do this year, the Kentucky Virtual Library, which is a huge resource, to be quite honest, it's the most cost-effective one that we have. That's the one that was $500, and you have multiple um, databases and resources that are available through that. Well, we had this idea, well, let's, we're paying for it, and the public library is paying for it, why are we both paying for it? So they were helping us to be able to use their um, access, but it's not working as well as we had hoped because we can't use it through the school. Kids can use it from home, but it's not working. We've kind of got some workarounds right now, but would, but there are conversations that are happening. To answer your question, long story short, there are lots of conversations happening. And I know the elementary schools have been using some resources with them as well, and we've been working with them to try to get them more involved, and us with them too. So it is definitely something that we are in, right in the midst of. I just want to thank you for all of this. Um, I've already scribbled a couple of notes. Um, I would encourage everybody to keep the materials. Uh, you know, as you have questions, um, maybe uh, ask a library media specialist at the school or ask um, Donda um, about your questions. But know that we're going to get back to this Great. very quickly and that we'll delve more deeply into this conversation because it, it is important. Thank you. So thank you for tonight. And thank you very much. Talk some more soon. Thank you. Thank you.